Welcome to Nursing School Explained and this video on respiratory alkalosis. If you feel like you need a little bit of a deeper dive into looking into the physiology and how, on how the body regulates pH and homeostasis, please check out my other video. I'll put it in the cards up here. But here for a quick review. So in our body, we produce carbonic acid, which is H2CO3, that can be broken down by either the respiratory or the renal systems. And the respiratory system simply breaks it down into carbon dioxide that we exhale and into water, which is the carbon dioxide here represents the acid and the water the base. And then in terms of the renal or metabolic system, the H2CO3 is broken down into HCO3- minus and H+, plus, which is bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. And the way that the kidneys do that, they regulate the amount of bicarbonate or hydrogen that they either reabsorb or excrete depending on what the pH requirements are. And the normal values is pH 7.35 through 7.45, where CO2 is 35 through 45. So you'll just leave the 7 out and then we have the same 35 and 45. And the bicarbonate normals are 22 through 26. And this acronym here, ROME, is very important and um, easy to remember when it comes to ABG interpretation because uh, what it stands for is respiratory opposite metabolic equal, and that refers to the pH. So when the pH is acidic, the respiratory will be the opposite. And so for respiratory alkalosis, what that means, in alkalosis, the pH is high, so it will be greater than 7.45. And because in respiratory um, is, is always opposite, the pH, the CO2 will be low. So the respiratory is opposite of the pH in respiratory alkalosis. And then over here, causes for respiratory alkalosis, anything that can cause hypoxemia. And think about this, if the body is starved for oxygen, it's going to increase the respiratory rate. So when we increase the respiratory rate, we breathe in more oxygen, but at the same time, we exhale more CO2, which then le lets the CO2, the acid, leave the body, which leaves us in an alkalotic state. So it leads to a CO2 deficit and CO2 levels well below as we discussed over here. Now, what can cause that? Acute pulmonary disorders, think about a pulmonary embolism, a severe pneumonia, ARDS, anything that affects the lung's ability to function and have a normal gas exchange. Then we have hyperventilation, and there could be several causes for that. So think about somebody who's having an anxiety or a panic attack, they typically tend to hyperventilate, which means that they're blowing off a lot of CO2. But it also occurs when uh, we have a fever, our respiratory rate will go up in, in order to try and uh, first of all get more oxygen in, but also cool off the body. Um, and then other things here will be CNS lesions, so think about tumors in the brain for example. Pregnancy, because the fetus um, as it grows, puts a lot of pressure on the diaphragm and it kind of impedes the woman's ability to take a nice deep breath, which in turn will up the respiratory rate to get the air in. And then respiratory center disorder. So this would be, let's say, a stroke or meningitis that affects the respiratory centers of the brain to where it's not functioning properly, leading to hyperventilation as well as liver failure and then also mechanical hyperventilation. So if the patient is on a ventilator and the ventilator is not adjusted correctly and the respiratory rate is high, it can lead to respiratory alkalosis. Signs and symptoms, patient will have that increase in respiratory rate that we talked about here. With that, they'll be complain about being lightheaded. There might be an altered level of consciousness or they might have a headache as that CO2 builds up, um, as that CO2 leaves the body. And then there is going to be an increase in heart rate. Just picture somebody who has a pneumonia, is in respiratory distress, the heart rate will go up also. And then dysrhythmia is because of low serum potassium levels and we'll look into that here a little bit. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, numbness and tingling. Think about again having uh, the person with the um, anxiety attack. They can get this numbness and tingling in the fingers and sometimes they can even have these carpal spasms where um, 
the fingers just kind of lock up. And then it can also lead to an increase in reflexes. And so let's look at how metabolic, um, sorry, respiratory alkalosis leads to dysrhythmias. So typically in an alkalotic state, the bicarbonate here, the base of the blood content will be high. So there's a high level of the bicarbonate and a low level of the acid, the CO2 in the blood. So we have all this uh, HCO3 in the bloodstream here and a little bit of hydrogen only and then also some potassium. Recall that potassium is typically an intracellular ion. Well, the body tries to regulate that not only with the respiratory system by blowing off or increasing the CO2, but it also can exchange the hydrogen ion for the potassium. So in the cell, not only do we have potassium along with other electrolytes, but we also have hydrogen ion. So in order to try and balance to increase that hydrogen ion and decrease the bicarbonate in the bloodstream, the body is going to pull out the hydrogen ion from the cell. But if something comes out, something has to be exchanged in return, and that'll be the potassium. So hydrogen ion comes out of the cell trying to balance out the bicarbonate in the bloodstream, and in exchange, the potassium moves from the intravascular into the intracellular space, leaving the serum low in potassium. Hence, alkalosis leads to serum low potassium, and as we know with potassium abnormalities, we always have to think about the arrhythmias. For treatment, we always need to treat the underlying cause. No um, amount of um, hydrogen ion that we give the patient is going to help um, do that if we don't treat the underlying cause. So looking back here at the causes, so hypoxemia, if the patient is hypoxic, certainly oxygen sounds like a good idea. Acute pulmonary disorders, pneumonia, give them antibiotics, pulmonary embolism, what can be done to dissolve that, that blood clot? Hyperventilation, for somebody who has having an anxiety attack, we coach them through deep breathing, and we'll get a little bit more into this here. If they have a fever, we'll give them some antipyretics. CNS lesions is a little bit more complicated. If there's a tumor, maybe we need to remove that tumor or decrease the intracranial pressure. Pregnancy, not a whole lot we can do about that, um, other than delivering the baby, but it all depends on the gestation of the woman. And then certainly if there's a stroke, there's treatment for that as well as meningitis. And if the ventilator is hyperventilating the patient, we just need to reduce that um, respiratory rate that the ventilator is controlling to bring the patient's pH balance down. And then for nursing care, always think about your A, Bs and Cs. And that helps you not only here in acid-base disorders, but also for any kind of exam. So airway, protect the airway. So if this patient is um, having an acute pulmonary embolism and they are being altered and they cannot maintain their airway, they're gonna need to be intubated. Uh, breathing, so we wanna give them O2. And in the case of hyperventilation, you might have heard of somebody who's hyperventilating and we give them a plastic, um, sorry, a paper bag to, to breathe into. Sometimes in the hospital, we'll put the patient on a non-rebreather mask that we actually don't give them oxygen. And it's just um, has that bag of that non-rebreather. And so same function as the paper bag, the patient exhales their CO2 into that bag. But if it gets contained in the bag on the non-rebreather, so they inhale the CO2 back, which will help us correct that CO2 deficit. Um, then for C, circulation, we always need to have good IV access on these patients so we can give them the appropriate medications for pneumonia, stroke, PE, any of those things that we need to treat. And certainly they need to be on a cardiac monitor because we know that we have, might have some potassium abnormalities. And then certainly we want to monitor their vital signs very closely, especially the respiratory rate and depth because that is what's, what's the underlying cause. We want to keep a close eye on their ABGs, on their electrolytes, again, because of the potassium. Do neuro checks if one of those underlying causes is due to some neurologic disorder, and then liver function if liver failure is the cause. So thank you for watching this video, video on respiratory alkalosis. Please also make sure to check out the videos on the other pH balance disturbances. 
and I'll see you soon right here on Nursing School Explained. Thanks for watching.